Hi, everybody. We're going to just give it a couple more minutes in case anyone, um, or just a couple more seconds, really, in case anyone's uh, joining us. But welcome to our November uh, installment of our Outbound Happy Hour Tours. Let's see, we got got a couple people in here, and I, I just want to say this is this is um, hopefully going to be a fun evening, and um, I see that you're all uh, muted now, and you can you can choose to stay that way. But I, I do invite you to um, unmute yourselves anytime you'd like and uh, chime in with your observations and interpretations of some of these great works that we're going to be looking at tonight. Uh, because I hope I hope this can just be a fun discussion uh, and really gives us a chance to appreciate some beautiful works by some of our American Indigenous artists in the collection and uh, see all the all the all the coding and the the spirit of activism that lies uh, behind the images that we see. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And while I do anyone wants to share uh, if and what they're drinking tonight on this during this happy hour, uh, feel free to put that in the chat. I'd love to see. Um, and I'll be jealous because I'm, I'm not drinking, I have a headache. Um, but I, I hope I hope you are and having a good time. So let's see here. There we go. And you see, we'll have a, we have a poll today, so feel free to chime in with your with your responses. Um, let's see. All right, so we will we will begin today um, by looking at this work by artist Jean Quick de C. Smith from our collection, and this is a um, mixed media on canvas from two thousand and one, titled um, "Where do uh, Excuse me, Where do we come from?" And this is uh, all of the works we'll be seeing today are from the Alpon collection. This one in particular is actually up on view right now in the, um, the pre-function spaces on the first floor. So if you're, if you're at the Alphonse sometime this week and you wanna take a look, I do encourage you to do so. And um, it's a fairly new acquisition. We got this back in 2018 and it's been um, just a wonderful addition providing a great springboard to have these conversations and dialogues um, around different uh, visual posts colonial methodologies uh, that are coming from artists from indigenous communities. Um, a little bit about the artist, John Quick to see Smith is of French Cree, Shoshone and uh, Salish heritage and is enrolled um, or is an enrolled member of the Confederate and Kootenai tribes of the Flathead Nations. As you see here, a lot of her work focuses on the use of maps and their ability to tell stories. Um, if you spend um, much time with maps um, of any kind, you start to notice that there's a code um, that's built into the way that they're designed. And those codes in the right hands can possess a couple layers of narratives that extend beyond um, ideas of land physicality, but into the areas of geopolitics and uh, capturing lived experiences. Uh, so before we go a little bit further uh, into the work, and I do have, um, I do invite you to put any comments that, as you see through in the chatter. If you have any questions, feel free to, like I said, unmic yourselves and chime in with a response. Um, but I want you to take a second to, to really look at this map because it's a little different than one we're used to seeing, right? We would expect these very um, well delineated uh, borders between states, uh, but instead we have 
something that's a little bit outside of that, right? Lots of dripping paint. Um, it drips into the oceans, it drips over state lines. And we have these pretty enticing questions that are asked of us as a viewer. And so to that, to that end, I say that before we even really get too far into unpacking um, her ideas why, it's important to first understand what kind of map this is. And that seems like a fairly uh, obvious uh, question. It would be, oh, it's a map of the United States. But actually what we're looking at is a type of map known as a counter map. And basically um, that word countering is basically uh, countering traditional modes of Western thought or Western being or production. And so these counter maps are these uh, very proactive post-colonial methods of uh, cartography, but their, their goal is not to help us get somewhere. Um, I guess, well, metaphorically, it helps us get to an idea, but not the way that maps help you get to destinations. Instead, they're really these tools um, of empowerment, particularly seen with, the, with indigenous communities um, that reveal and uh, bring to the forefront forcibly erased histories to, um, to, to shed light and give voice to these marginalized groups. And so where, uh, where official maps, if you're thinking about it, are uh, blank counter maps have, um, they have uh, a purpose to tell a story. So we all sometimes we'll see that they, for instance, have um, drawings on them that detail maybe spaces that were dangerous or spaces that um, held specific battles instead of just, oh, this is this specific city or this is um, an area belonging to this country or that country. Um, they're really kind of sharing information about a generation or about a collective culture. And so with a little bit of that understanding, um, what it's really doing on a larger scale is um, not presenting what we traditionally expect, which is this, you know, this fixed image um, with um, with a fixed history and with these fixed um, place markers. If we're thinking in terms of like borders and demarcations, um, instead they're going against all of these um, very normative formulas and visual styles that we're expecting. And by not following or kind of straying outside of this uniform scale and purpose um, with the kinds of icons that we expect to see that detail um, cardinal directions and distances and locations, uh, it's giving us instead this more qualitative um, capture of, of a human experience or of a time and place or, or of an event specifically. So, um, so Smith's take these these counter maps in turn to these um, militant artistic weapons, so to speak, um, within her practice, because she's very much an activist. And we see this with her maps, uh, with her full body of work. Um, and this is something that she began back around 1992, um, in well, not in celebration, in, in really encounter to the celebration of the Columbus Quincentennial. Um, because she really, looking back in history, she kind of identifies that as being the nascent moment when Western colonization, uh, coloniz colonialization, goodness, um, really kind of takes root and starts. So typical of her work um, is to use uh, icons as images that are very instantly recognizable. Um, like here, you have the US map, which is a shape, even if it didn't have colors or borders, and it was just the outline of this map, it's something that we would instantly um, identify. But she's, she's interrupted it here, right? So here we go back to that visual analysis where she has used um, these, these slightly uh, unfamiliar um, ways of rendering this image um, as a bit of a twist. So we have Again, the dripping canvas where all the state borders are bleeding into one another. 
Um, and if you look closely, hopefully this is large enough on your screen, you'll notice that there are no names, right? Just the three questions. And so um, with these words, what the work is doing is drawing, um, just doing a couple things. On one end, which is slightly less obvious, it's drawing on modern art and mid 20th century art history as a form of inspiration, but also as a way of uh, legitim legitimizing um, her identity as an artist and as an American um, and as an inheritor of the same uh, histories and heritage that anyone who's coming from the Western world um, would, would uh, feel privileged to have. Uh, and so she inserts her work, these counter maps, these very, um, these very uh, socially aware uh, pieces into that, that Western uh, art lineage um, by this one specifically uh, by connecting it through the title. So we have, where do we come from? What are we, where are we going? Is actually the same name as a piece by um, artist Paul Gauguin from 1890. I'm gonna progress there so you can see, maybe you guys are familiar with it if you've been to the MFA in Boston. Um, so we have um, two paintings here, basically, if we're thinking of uh, Smith's and this one by Gauguin. Uh, they have the same name, but where this one by Gauguin focuses on uh, Europe, Europe, overall European uh, grapplings with uh, indigenous claims um, and identity in Tahiti, uh, and the other, the, the one by Smith, focuses on a much larger political commentary about these transformed landscapes um, due to American expansion. They're both um, seeking a form of legitimacy in their own respective ways, um, despite the very uh, large differences in topics and also um, their the, ex the cultural experiences that they're kind of tracing over. So this one, um, he's using uh, frescoes. You see a lot of gold ground in some of the central figures and in the corners. Um, and, and it's very large. Um, as you can see the measurement from this, it's 139 inches by, oh, sorry, centimeters by 374 centimeters. So it's, it's, it's quite large, which would connect it to history paintings because if we're thinking of the hierarchy of academic painting, uh, history painting being the most important, uh, size also quite mattered. It literally as, uh, as easy a translation as the bigger the better. Um, and so, you know, you have someone who is um, working, um, he was a post-impressionist, so he's working within these, these modern art, um, these, these nuanced movements happening within modern art, which are already so separated from traditional academic painting, uh, but they're trying to find their own space. Um, similarly so, looking at, um, or coming back to the work by Smith, we have her inserting her work for much different reasons in that same tradition, not just of, of modern art, but also of, 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 of Western art and that tradition. Um, so re returning here in these, these little twists that she adds with the, drip, with the drippings and the, the emission of names, um, and, well, and also with these questions that she's asking us, um, which we see in several of the other works. Uh, some of them, for instance, I don't have any examples here, but some of them have the same kind of drippings and it's a US map, but only the names of the states that um, are can be traced back to having um, native indigenous names stay, the rest are omitted. Um, so with some, she creates these kind of color codes um, that are meant, um, regardless, regardless of, of what tactic she uses in her work, uh, their, their goal is to um, spark some form of reaction in the viewer that really resonates in one of two ways. Um, on one end, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's something that's familiar but different. So it's a type of ploy to draw the viewer in and make you look more deeper, uh, or more deeply, sorry, um, at what she's doing and kind of question um, these uh, dominantly established um, 
methods of, of knowledge that we have regarding maps and, and how terrain is represented and what it means. Um, but at the same time, they are uh, a point of departure for examining the political treatment of native peoples in the United States. So if you think about the, um, the way that we're raised in school, we've been looking at maps for a long time, right? So traditionally we read these maps um, basically from the east to the west. If we're thinking of that manner in which we read it, we're thinking of uh, American history, right? We start with these the 13 colonies in the United States, and then we slowly start to continue west. Um, so accidentally, we're almost complicit in this, right? And we're feeding the system um, that is largely informed down to the way that we read maps um, by a much larger historical narrative that is largely based on these uh, consequences, these ideas around manifest destiny and this um, this expansion, or really, if we think about it as a, as a counter term, this dis, uh, displacing of what was there before, right? It's almost like, uh, if you guys remember uh, blackboards back in school, and those ridiculously large erasers that uh, were way too big to erase one line, you would start, you would only use them when you were going to clear everything out, right? So as you go, you're just wiping out everything that's there for what's coming and that's new. Um, but just to keep going with this metaphor of the eraser, because I'm now committed, um, you are leaving a residue. And so it's never fully, fully erased, right? There's, uh, you, can, you can whitewash it, but in terms of these, of these maps, it's a way to kind of reveal what was left underneath and bring light to the fact that it's not about one replacing and displacing the other, but rather them coexisting uh, and retaining everything that was. And so um, I think that's a good setup for us before we move into our next, uh, our next artist, because these ideas are at the core in, in different ways. They're using different lenses, but really grappling with, with, these, um, with these ideas and with these um, consequences that affect identity and uh, community collectives um, for all of the artists featured here today. So we're gonna progress to the next artist that we'll be looking at tonight. And we're actually gonna be, we're doing a, a double feature for Jeffrey Gibson um, and looking at two of his works. Um, but to give you a little bit of background information on the artist before we start unpacking um, what is uh, without secret, one of my favorite works in the collection, and I use it anytime I can, um, this work called I Don't Belong to You, You Don't Belong to Me from 2016. And so Jeffrey Gibson, it's important to note as we're looking at his work that the idea of acceptance, belonging, and being comfortable with these things once you have accept accepted them and by extension who you are, are really important in different ways across his body of work. So here we have instantly what jumps out at us is the, or these, these words, I don't belong to you, you don't belong to me. And um, those are pretty powerful, right? Instantly we start thinking of um, ideas of creating your own agency and of severing uh, dysfunctional or toxic bonds. And so to really understand the impact and the importance of how, how they happened and where they stem, from where they stem, we, we have to look at his, his background. And so he grew up, um, he spent much of his childhood, even though he was born in the United States, he spent much of his childhood in, um, in Germany and in Korea. And um, he's someone who's from Choctaw and Cherokee nations of Mississippi. But when he was living abroad, he was always really treated as, oh, an American living in Europe or an American living, uh, whether it was in Germany or in Korea. And so he was very, um, aware of on some level being connected to his American heritage, but because he's existing outside of it and because by default of not being a naturalized citizen of the countries where he was spending portions of his childhood, um, he had that, that outsider experience, this, uh, the, the experience of the observer for lack of a better term. 
And so he moves, returns to the United States and there it's not lost on him that he's finally back in his country of, of, of his, you know, his native country where he, you know, where he belongs, you know, to, 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 lo to use this very loaded term and still kind of an outsider. Um, so, so that's just in terms of, of country and nation. But when we start looking at the different communities to which he belongs, it goes far beyond the cities where he was raised versus the country uh, where he was born. But really, he is um, also part of the LGBTQ community. So he's um, experiencing life um, as a gay man in the specifically in the in the 80s and the 90s. But he's he's been in Europe for so long. He he grew up outside or really not, not really experiencing the AIDS epidemic in the way that so many people in that community, because we're, we're kind of for momentarily compartmentalizing all the different communities to which he has belonged or rather not belonged. Um, and so even, even that, which is so tied to his identity, he feels like he's an observer because he didn't, um, he, he talks a little bit about feeling something akin to survivor's guilt, but not quite. Um, but he's having that disembodied experience of, you know, I share this with you, but I, I cannot relate to what you went through. So again, I am observing from the outside. And then even connected to uh, the native communities to which he belonged, he was not raised in them. So moving back uh, later on in life, there's still an element of that um, outsider observing because this is not this was not a uh, not natural to him these these practices uh, because on top of the fact that he grew up outside of them these weren't things that were carried uh, carried through in the day to day traditions with his family he talks a lot about his um, his uh, his parents and his grandparents kind of uh, severing ties with indigenous uh, cult culture indigenous practices and traditions um, and leaning more towards um, assimilation and embodying these more American and urban um, facets of his identity and of their collective identity as a family. So he was very much an outsider, even though he was someone who we would identify now as belonging to intersectional communities, but absolutely felt no, no rooting or no anchoring in either in any of them. So as you can imagine, that would be very frustrating, um, not just for someone who's really growing and, and shaping as an adult, but someone who is a practicing artist because how much of our identity in some form um, affects the work that we produce. So, um, so with this work, we see, and we're going to continue that that idea of belonging and and ties to to, to communities more uh, in the in the following work as well. But right now, I want us to kind of look at um, what we have here in front of us, and this is a diptych made of glass crow beads and tobacco tin jingles along the side. And so here we see a bit of a blending of these spaces because um, in, in conversation to, or in, in concert with saying that he had that um, quasi survivor's guilt uh, and didn't really feel like he belonged so much in as part of part of the gay community, he did find um, some solace and acceptance in a gay club culture in New York City of, of the 80s and into the specifically the 90s. And so um, in these spaces, uh, these, these safe spaces for so many, you have these power anthems, such as the one who provided the lyrics for this piece here, um, which comes from uh, George Michael, uh, specifically his song Freedom 90 from 1990. Uh, and that was one of the, one of the um, singles that came off of his Listen Without Prejudice, which I believe was his, his sophomore solo album. But there, even he as an artist really starts to break away from this mold that was that was set up for him um, and starts to kind of hint without officially coming out uh, that that he was going to start doing things a little more his way. So there's there's connections there. Um, and 
uh, Gibson in his work uses the power of word and the power of, uh, in this case, lyric to really bring these ideas through. Oops, sorry. So to go back to, to this piece, so we see a connection there in the text, and this is something that he does often. Um, it really started with him um, in, in terms of his body of work with the Everlast series, which um, if we have any any boxers or, or kickboxers in the group today, um, Everlast, that is the brand of, of punching bags that you see in gyms, and uh, which is which seems really random, right? Except to say that as he was grappling with all of these ideas and all these all this confusion, he took a boxing to blow off some steam, which seems like a really good idea actually, and it became a really cathartic process. So. He ended up um, kind of forming a bond with these with these punching bags as symbols of um, with these masculine symbols that also kind of absorbed a lot of violence, and so he dressed them in these um, in these beautiful um, decorative hangings made of these same crow beads and these jingles, and they had these words, these very empowering words, which early on was mostly based on uh, song lyrics, but then eventually. Um, turned to also just general phrasing. Um, but that's kind of where I got it started. But the the impact and the ideas behind them are the same. And if you look carefully at the the backgrounds of these of these two diptychs, you see these triangular shapes. And so here we have him kind of digging a little deeper into his cultural background and creating or really giving a nod to indigenous textile patterning. But more than that, he's also extending at hand as a type of ally because he's also looking at the quilt patterning of uh, African American communities in the South. So two groups of marginalized peoples that are trying to to claim visibility um, to overcome a, a horrible legacy that was um, pretty much decided for them. And so through through something as simple as that graphic element. He, he connects that. Um, we're gonna see him using graphic shapes again in the next work because there is, there's a definite influence of op art, which is basically optical art and the idea of how geometric shapes affect our perception and how we uh, look at planes of space. He doesn't adopt their ideas 100%, but it is influenced by them. And, um, and like I said, we'll talk about that a little bit more the next piece because it's a little more obvious there. Uh, but if you look a little even closer, uh, hidden amongst all of these triangles are really not that hidden, but embedded within them. And this textile patterning are these four uh, pink upside down triangles, which if you can see my cursor on the screen, you'll see that I'm pointing at them. And if not, I just, just look for the pink if you can't see my cursor. Um, but those are Another nod to another marginalized community, and if those look familiar, it's because they are meant to represent the Rosa Winkle, which was a um, like a patch that was um, assigned to um, prisoners in concentration camps during um, World War II in Nazi Germany who identified as being homosexual. And so that was just another way to uh, label them in, in a very negative context, because we know how that kind of ends. Uh, for a lot of people um, in the same way that you would wear this, the yellow star of David if you were of the Jewish faith. So the that community has reclaimed um, this as an emblem of pride. So this is now uh, a way that the LGBTQ can, you know, give voices and names and credit the histories and the lives of so many people that were lost during that time period. Um, and so he does include that here. And so in a way it brings together and it helps him set up ground within all these communities that for so long he felt just as an observer, but that were really part of who he is in a, in a, very, uh, in a very permanent and positive way. Um, so like I said, uh, back to George Michael, but we're gonna, we're gonna look at this other work by Jeffrey Gibson that is also in our collection. Um, and if not just for the colors that are beautiful, there is so much uh, hidden and coded in this work. Um, it is completely by accident that it is teal, uh, which as we know, RMA, we, that is our favorite color here, but um, it is a beautiful work and quite quite worth looking at in person. 
And so if you remember, I discussed earlier when we were looking at his other work that his family um, really intentionally moved away from um, culturally indigenous aspects of the self and really pushed for the, um, this more assimilated American construction. And with that, there was uh, an understanding, not just within his family, but also if we're looking at, at Western arts and that academic tradition, especially immediately after the war period, um, the, um, the idea of what was indigenous or what was coming out of, um, or what was expected of indigenous artists, um, it had that, uh, that legacy, that, that residue of being connected to, to ideas of, of primitism and just being very primitive. And so he's, he's, this is going to impact his uh, resistance to leaning into his culture and finding inspiration in it in his work. But we see here in this, in this, um, this acrylic uh, painting here that it's not made on traditional canvas. It's actually on deer hide. And so starting with the figures that are on it, we have, we see these geometric shapes again. So once, once more, we have that little bit of a nod to, to op art because he is very much tuned in with um, what modern, what's happening, not just in modern art, but in contemporary art and really trying to make his, make his place uh, within the, within the, within the art world uh, and is quite, is becoming quite frustrated, but uh, he does pretty early on recognize it and still more than ever now in his work that he uh, finds a lot of, uh, a lot of power in these, these shapes, these geometric shapes. So as you notice, um, and if, if any, if you guys ever have a chance to look at other paintings, uh, particularly the ones I think in this uh, series, which is called Constellations, and this is number 11 of that series, that he's consciously emitting um, many kind of images, instead kind of giving into his fascination with just the geometric shape. Um, because as I said before, he, he finds that they're, they're so powerful, um, these, these little, um, these elements that are foundational in so many ways, right? Um, because geometric shapes make up images and um, shapes uh, independently become, if you put them together, they become letters that then become words. And then these words and these images shape narratives. So at, at their core, these geometric shapes and their most essentialized, you know, um, understanding and depiction are building blocks to, to an entire world of storytelling. And so we see behind it here, you can kind of see how the back is, is cream colored. And that's because as I, as I mentioned before, this is actually um, animal hide. This one specifically is deer hide. And he started, he, were, he started using um, hides back in around 2011 because uh, as I said, it's, it's been a process. He's grappling with his identity as an artist. And this is an additional step because if you're thinking of being an artist as something that is a part of who you are and everyone is always growing and changing and in the process, this, this flux process of becoming, then it's, it's, under, you know, it's, it's expected that his work continues to reflect all the personal um, growth and the, um, the identities that he starts to, that he grapples with over his lifetime. And so he, um, he switches over to rawhide and it's really quite um, quite beautiful to hear his to hear him talk about his, the philosophy as to why, and a lot of that is really rooted in the cultural beliefs of indigenous communities regarding the many ways that animals can be used. And so he opts to step away from canvas um, because, uh, and if you think. Uh, if you think back to the first piece we saw with John Quick to C. Smith, uh, and we were looking at those maps, 
it's it's a map, right? Which you would say, oh, it's such an innocuous thing. But we understand when we start looking at the history of how maps are shaped and what they mean and how they're used and how they're, they often erase what was there before. Her introduction of this different map as a counter map is, exists in relation to, um, to subverting the, the status quo and to upsetting uh, productively these Western, these entrenched uh, Western traditions. And so with him using the canvas, he talks about how he, uh, it becomes almost um, a counter material, not a counter map, but a counter material, because when he was working on canvas, he couldn't, he couldn't help um, thinking about how when you're, when you're creating art on it, that canvas instantly becomes a starting point from within a historical structure of painting, we're thinking Western historical structure. So by starting on this hide that is so connected to indigenous communities and to, to um, issues of you know, indigenous beliefs on sustainability and what the earth gives you and how to use it, you're stepping outside of that Western trajectory and you're creating something that exists on parallel but it's not born of it. So it's, it's, it's a really fascinating connection to the materials that he uses in his work. And I think it gives it a really um, holistic philosophy that, that, I, that, that makes understanding his work uh, and his interpretations even stronger in my opinion. Um, so you have this, this hide as the base and then you have these very free shapes that he intentionally, even though he, he understands how they can be grouped and how they can change and into these words or images that create narratives, he keeps them as the geometric shape on purpose um, because by keeping them as these original uh, essentialized elements uh, in their, in their, in their pre-becoming before they would turn into a word or an image, it, it kind of suspends them um, as, as objects of potential. Uh, and they they live in this this stasis where they can be anything they want to be, and that's a really interesting approach to how he thinks about not just materials but his 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 work and and the the things that he is creating. When you think of it as being a mirror to how he's finally seeing his his production as an artist. So, like I said, identity and art they're so intrinsically tied. Um. Do we, uh, does any, and we, I know we just looked at two pieces by Jeffrey Gibson, but if anyone has any questions or wants to comment on his before we move on to our next artist, feel free to do so. But if there are no questions, then we'll move on to our last artist here, which is um, Hawk EAV, Heap of, uh, Edgar Heap of Birds. And with his work, um, there is great purpose. He's he's known for creating a lot of signs in different ways, and in a, in a very similar style to Jean Quick de C. Smith, his work is very much about countering and revealing. So we have this intent to uh, reset history in many ways, um, and at its core, what it's really doing is trying to reveal and be very truthful and upcoming with what really happened to Native peoples, particularly during the 19th century. Um, although he connects it, depending on the works that we're seeing, he connects it to the, to the contemporary current um, moment and, and depending on, on what social issue we're, we're, we're grapp grappling with within that community. Um, but he really sees um, protecting indigenous peoples and indigenous communities, not just in the United States, but around the world as a major part of his job as an artist. So he definitely identifies as an artist activist, but an activist, I would argue first and foremost. Um, he often, uh, when we look at his work, he's often including uh, text. Actually, to be perfectly honest, I know that they exist, but I have personally not seen any of his work that isn't text-based. So. He's really um, emphasizing the power of language uh, in shaping 
um, not just identity, but society. Um, and even because these are, he creates a lot of signs that go in the earth. Uh, they are th through that act, the language is helping to, um, to shape and speak to the land upon which they are existing or coexisting. If we're thinking of these two, um, these two histories, uh, the, the told and the untold that, that he is uh, forefronting and, and tackling with much of his work. Um, but we're looking at, if you look at this, this piece right now that's on the screen, uh, these, these signs are tacked on a wall, right? And so by displaying in a museum, I think it's really interesting that suddenly we add uh, another dimension of space uh, to claim or to dispute uh, because the second this language enters the museum, um, it's broken into the, you know, the, what do you call it? The white cube, right? The, the ivory tower of, uh, of something that's, uh, of, a, of a space that is so charged with being central to how culture is created and disseminated in the United States, well, in the Western world. Um, and it's uh, bringing in bodies that are traditionally excluded from, from these spaces. Um, but with this work, as you can see, the last, the last of the three signs uh, lets us know that we're, we're talking also, we're connecting that the now with the past um, mid, mid 19, well, early to mid 19th century, it's also bringing in a lot of people who have passed who, who whose lives were uh, basically forced from them in many ways. Uh, so it's, it's working on a couple of different levels. Um, and so what we can deduce from, from, from his work overall is that he, he uses art um, as a weaponizing of these words and directly confronts, um, let's say American viewers because he's, you know, he's showing these in the United States um, and elsewhere as well, but we're, we're looking at this within, within the context of the here and now. Um, he's confronting the viewers as being complicit with their colonial pasts um, and, and it's very violent legacy in a, in a way that we saw with the first piece by Jean Quick to see Smith with those questions. And so, you know, these are um, indictments and accusations that are calling out things like state violence against indigenous peoples and really help transform the language of protest into a form of poetry that's very much rooted in, um, in personal and collective memory. So as you see here, you have on the first, uh, the first line, do you choose to walk? Were you forced to walk? Trail of Tears, 1830, uh, 36. And so um, as a contemporary audience, well, I'll get to that in a second, but it, in its actuality, it's really speaking to uh, the incident that is uh, the Indian Removal Act of 18, uh, 1830 which is where under uh, President Andrew Jackson, there were forced relocations, uh, not just to Southeastern, it also happened um, in, in the Northern part of the country, but predominantly in the Southeast um, of, of indigenous tribes to, to areas West of the Mississippi. So basically you have um, the good land for lack of a better term, right? You have uh, Americans very much motivated by land acquisition of, of areas that were uh, deemed of higher value within the state borders and also by gold on a very, um, you know, lands that had gold or that were suspected to have gold. And so a lot of these tribes were, were forced out. Uh, and even though the law required that the government um, negotiate peaceful removals and that, that were fair and, and, and voluntary, which is the important word, they really, they really were not. Many of these people were really um, far beyond coerced, but were forced um, to give up their lands. And so, you know, over 100,000 were relocated, uh, probably closer to 130,000 and, and easily, easily 15,000 of them died uh, in that process due to hunger, disease, the cold, because, you know, you do have a change of climate if you're just starting to move west as we as we well know 
in the southeast of, 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 uh, of the United States living here in Florida. Um, and so he's, he's acknowledging that, but at the same time, so those questions are really posed to those who experienced this specific, um, this specific journey and it poses, you know, where did you, was it your choice or were you forced? But at the same time, I think it works on two levels because as a contemporary audience, we look at these and it, I can't have got allyship on the brain from, from our, our current exhibition, Ally is a Verb, but I see, do you choose to walk or were you forced to walk as kind of a, on some level, a call to, to us as viewers to really think of where, where we stand on these issues and what we're doing as a, as a, as a modern and hopefully per progressive uh, national community to, to, to create change and, and help, um, help really uh, make a lasting impact. Um, but at the same time, this is art, right? And it's, it's in a museum. So it really, um, it brings up questions about the art market and, and artistic purpose and he's very, um, as, as an artist, he's very much about decommercializing art and really bypassing uh, those potentially staged uh, and um, complex, we'll say, relationships that, that, ha that, that are often seen within that world. Um, and and the, the idea of professionalizing it as a kind of market and um, takes trips when he when he when he goes to for for you know either for things like biennials or or for art openings and he kind of sidesteps that entire community and instead um, takes uh, trips out into uh, local indigenous groups um, and this is whether he's in the United States or anywhere else on on, on earth and um, he says the way he sees it. Um, these, uh, what is happening in these communities, um, nothing is, nothing is for monetary gain. He, uh, he talks about, uh, like solstice ceremonies and, and, and different, um, different ritual dances and, um, gatherings. And, and he says, no one is dancing for pay, which I think is such a powerful line. Uh, nothing is, nothing is for sales. He's basically trying to say, um, so it's not about, creating these bonds so that he can go then produce art that it that has a market that translates into basically the experiences uh, um, commercialized into something that can be bought and sold instead it's really about um, building those relationships about um, creating um, work that is uh, motivated by something outside of what can be uh, given a, a price um, and really um, creating um, something that bonds. These, 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 that's the, the whole point of these collaborations. So he'd rather spend time there and um, exist in a very traditional place um, so that when he does leave that and, and goes back into this more contemporary um, urban sphere, um, the motivations that, that go with you to produce and to yourself are rooted in these, um, transparent and sincere, um, pockets of experience rather than, than translated into, into just something that is, that is produced for value. So definitely a powerful artist um, and one that I think we're very privileged to have in our collection. Um, and that's, that's what I have for you today. Um, I hope you're not <laughs> sick of hearing me talk. And I do, uh, do invite you all to, to unmic or, um, or ask any questions, whether it's verbally, which I hope, or, or in the chat. Uh, and I'm going to, now that I'm, I'm gonna unshare my screen so that I can see anything you guys might've put in the comment boxes.
Well, if, if there are no questions, then, then I just want to thank you for joining me tonight. And I hope that you will go see these works on view. Um, as I mentioned, the Jean-Quick de C. Smith is at the Alphand Inn on the first floor. And the first one, the first one that we looked at by Jeffrey Gibson with the, with the two panels, I Don't Belong to You, You Don't Belong to Me, is on exhibit now at the museum in the uh, front gallery exhibition, Ally is a Verb. Uh, do join us again next month uh, when we tackle end of year reflections and um, make another drink and uh, spend some time before the before the year ends. Um, so with that, have have a great night and I and we hope and next month. Thank you.